Hello, I'm Dr. David Spock from the University of Washington. In this National HIV Curriculum Mini Lecture, I'm going to provide an update for some recent recommendations related to immunizations for persons with HIV. This talk is going to focus on updates for three important vaccines for people with HIV, pneumococcal, hepatitis B, and herpes zoster. In the following discussion, I'm going to focus on recommendations that have been issued in this year, 2022. First, let's take a look at streptococcus pneumonia immunization, which is most often referred to as pneumococcal immunization. It's important first to understand the two main types of pneumococcal vaccines, polysaccharide vaccines and conjugate vaccines. The polysaccharide vaccine is known as PPSV23, or Pneumovax 23, and it contains 23 pneumococcal serotypes. There are three pneumococcal conjugate vaccines that are commercially available, PCV13, or Prevnar 13, PCV15, or Vax Nuvance, and PCV20, or Prevnar 20. The PCV15 and PCV20 vaccines or new vaccines, and both received FDA approval in 2021. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccines provide more robust and longer-lasting immunity than the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. The polysaccharide and conjugate pneumococcal vaccines do not contain live bacteria, so there is no risk of getting infected from the vaccines. This image is showing the serotypes that are contained in the conjugate pneumococcal vaccines. The PCV13 is the older vaccine. Note the PCV15 and 20 contain all of the same serotypes in PCV13, with the addition of two additional serotypes in PCV15 and seven additional serotypes with PCV20. These additional serotypes are shown with a yellow outer border. Now let's go through the updated pneumococcal recommendations for adults with HIV, first addressing recommendations for adults who are pneumococcal vaccine naive. In the September 21st, 2022 update in the Adult Opportunistic Infection Guidelines, there were new recommendations for pneumococcal immunization. For adults with HIV who have not previously received pneumococcal immunization, there are two new options. The first is to give one dose of PCV15, followed at least eight weeks later with one dose of PPSV23. Or, a second option is to give one dose of PCV20. With either of these approaches, there are no subsequent additional pneumococcal vaccine doses that should be administered. Ideally, these vaccines are given after a person starts on antiretroviral therapy and their CD4 count is greater than 50 cells per cubic millimeter. These new recommendations eliminate the use of the older PCV13 vaccine. So what do you do if the person with HIV previously started the vaccine series and received the older conjugate vaccine, PCV13? In this situation, the current recommendation is to complete the vaccine schedule as per the older recommendations, as shown here. This requires several doses of the PPSV23 vaccine. In draft documents, the CDC has suggested this recommendation may be revised in 2023, so keep a lookout for any changes that are coming up in 2023. Now let's switch gears and look at new recommendation for hepatitis B immunization in persons with HIV. Hepatitis B immunization is recommended for all persons with HIV who do not have immunity to hepatitis B and who do not have active hepatitis B infection. This discussion will also include recommendations for vaccine non-responders. Before reviewing the different types of hepatitis B vaccines, it's important to understand that hepatitis B virus has an outer surface that is rich in antigens. There are three major types of surface antigens as shown here, pre-S1, pre-S2, and S. The types of hepatitis B vaccines have expanded in recent years. There are three main types of hepatitis B vaccines as shown in this figure. 
first going from left to right, there are the older single antigen hepatitis B vaccines, Recombivax HB and Endurex B. These are surface antigen vaccines that are made up entirely by the surface antigen S protein. In 2017, the Heplosav B vaccine was approved by the FDA. This is also a recombinant single antigen S antigen vaccine, but the surface antigen is linked with the highly potent CPG1018 adjuvant. The newest hepatitis B vaccine, shown on the far right, Prehebrio, was FDA approved in 2021. This is a triple antigen vaccine that includes the S, Pre-S1, and Pre-S2 antigens. I will not mention the triple antigen vaccine further since it's not been incorporated into national guidelines as of late 2022. All of these vaccines are recombinant vaccines and there's no possibility of acquiring hepatitis B infection from the vaccine. So let's review the new hepatitis B vaccine recommendations that were issued in the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines on September 7, 2022. In the updated guidance, the preferred vaccines for persons with HIV who have not previously received hepatitis B vaccine has not changed and these vaccines are Endurex B and Recombivax HB. The major new recommendation is to use a double dose, three dose series given at zero, one, and six months. For both vaccines, this is an A2 recommendation. Note the standard dose of Endurex B is 20 micrograms of hepatitis B surface antigen per dose, so double dose requires 40 micrograms of hepatitis B surface antigen per dose. Similarly, the standard dose of Recombivax is 10 micrograms of hepatitis B surface antigen per dose, so double dose is 20 micrograms of hepatitis B surface antigen per dose. With these new recommendations, the use of Heplosav B is an alternative or C3 recommendation. The Heplosav B vaccine consists of two doses given one month apart using a standard amount of hepatitis B surface antigen. The Heplosav B recommendation has a lower rating primarily due to limited published data with Heplosav B in persons with HIV. The guidelines also include an option for persons who need immunization against both Hepatitis B and Hepatitis A to give the standard three-dose series with twin ricks. It's important to point out that the Hepatitis B antigen in the Twinrix vaccine is the antigen component in the Endurex B vaccine. Since the Twinrix vaccine contains 20 micrograms of Endurex B antigen per dose, each vaccine dose of Twinrix only provides a standard amount of hepatitis B surface antigen, which is not consistent with the new recommendations to use double dose hepatitis B surface antigen with each dose. For this reason, in my opinion, I do not think using standard dose Twinrix is optimal to use in persons with HIV unless you supplement each dose with an extra standard dose 20 micrograms of Endurex B. One question that frequently comes up in the clinic is should you defer starting the hepatitis B vaccine series when seeing a person newly diagnosed with HIV who has a low CD4 count? The Opportunistic Infection Guidelines address this in a statement. They state, although vaccine response is better in patients with CD4 count greater than 350, vaccination should not be deferred in patients with a lower CD4 count because some people with CD4 less than 350 do respond to vaccination. I think the logic behind this recommendation is that if the person does not respond to the vaccine series, you can always try again when their CD4 count is higher. For all people with HIV who receive hepatitis B vaccine, it's important to check a hepatitis B surface antibody titer one to two months after completion of the vaccine series, with a titer greater than 10 considered protective. Since a significant number of people with HIV don't achieve a protective titer, it's important to address how to manage these hepatitis B vaccine non-responders. There are several recommended options for vaccine non-responders. The main options that have an equal B3 rating are to give a three-dose, double-dose series 
with Indirex B or Recombivax HB or use the two-dose Heplosav B vaccine. In my opinion, I think using the double-dose, three-dose series is reasonable if the person receives standard-dose Indirex B or Recombivax on their first vaccine series or if they received the vaccine series at a time when their CD4 count was less than 350. If neither of these are the case, I would prefer to use Heplosav B in this situation, extrapolating from the overall stronger immune responses seen with this vaccine in persons without HIV who are immune compromised. An ongoing study with Heplosav B in persons with HIV should provide more data on this issue in the near future. The additional option to consider in this situation is to use four-dose, double-dose with Indirex B or Recombivax, but this is not nearly as practical as the two-dose Heplosav B option. Let's finish with new varicella zoster recommendations for persons with HIV. First, as a reminder, the older vaccine, Zoster Vaccine Live, also referred to as ZVL or Zostavax, consists of attenuated live varicella zoster virus. The newer vaccine, recombinant zoster vaccine, also referred to as RZV or Shingrix, is a recombinant zoster vaccine that contains a potent ASO1B adjuvant. In the United States, the older zoster vaccine, Zostavax, has not been available since November 2020. Thus, all zoster vaccine recommendations in the United States now pertain only to the newer RZV or Shingrix vaccine. In September 2022, the Opportunistic Infection Guidelines issued a new recommendation that all people with HIV who are 18 years of age and older should receive the RZV or Shingrix vaccine. Note this age cutoff of 18 years and older is a major change from the previous recommendation to give zoster vaccine only to people with HIV who are 50 years of age and older. The RZV vaccine requires two doses given two to six months apart. With the old live zoster vaccine, Zostavax, there was a concern that persons with a low CD4 count could develop disseminated varicella zoster virus infection from the vaccine. With the newer recombinant vaccine, Shingrix, there is no risk of infection from the vaccine, and thus there are no CD4 restrictions that prohibit the use of the vaccine. But the guidelines recommend considering delaying giving RZV until the patient is virologically suppressed on antiretroviral therapy or until the CD4 count is greater than 200. The rationale for this recommendation is to ensure a robust immune response, not because of any safety concerns. In clinical practice, the issue occasionally arises as to whether you can give the zoster vaccine to a person with an active case of shingles. The opportunistic infection guidelines address this issue by stating, do not give the RZV shingrix during acute episodes. Most experts in this situation would wait until the acute illness is over and symptoms have resolved before giving the RZV vaccine. Now, what do you do in the situation where a person with HIV was previously given ZVL or the Zostavax vaccine? So, if a person with HIV has previously received ZVL or Zostavax, they should repeat the Zoster vaccine immunization and receive two doses of RZV or Shingrix. So, let's summarize three key new vaccine recommendations for persons with HIV. First, there are two new pneumococcal conjugate vaccines and a new and simplified pneumococcal vaccine schedule for persons with HIV. Basically, you give one dose of the PCV20, one and done, or you give one dose of PCV15 followed eight weeks later with the dose of the polysaccharide vaccine, one plus one. Second, persons with HIV who require hepatitis B vaccine and who have not been previously immunized, a three-dose series with Indirex B or Recombivax HB is preferred. But note, the new recommendation is to use double dose of hepatitis B surface antigen with each dose of vaccine. 
And last, the previous age cutoff for the recommendation to give Zoster vaccine, Shingrix, to persons with HIV has changed from 50 years of age and older to 18 years of age and older. Thank you. The production of this National HIV Curriculum Mini Lecture was supported by funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration.